My name's Stephen Kenyon and I'm a teaching and learning consultant for Lancashire LPDS. This week on LPDS TV, my colleague Rachel and I will be focusing on the great outdoors. This episode is built around key learning in English, history and science. July is an amazing time in British gardens. Everything seems to be coming to life, filling our gardens with colour. So why not take some time out in some natural spaces in your locality this month? Even at this exciting time, gardeners can face pests and problems. If you're involved in growing plants or crops, you will eventually face some challenges or difficulties in growing your plants. These hydrangeas look really healthy, but fungus is affecting some of the leaves. And as gardeners, we need to do something about that. But we also need to be careful not to have a negative impact on the environment. Weed killers and pesticides are freely available but they can be full of harmful chemicals which can damage the environment. Now gardening without chemicals can take a little bit more thought and planning but by harnessing nature's natural defences we can create beautiful gardens without damaging the environment. This simple spray is made from garlic, water and some plant-based uh, washed up liquid very simple to make and I'm actually reusing um, a spray gun from something else and um, so that's a bit of recycling as well and all you need to do is to spray the leaves of the hydrangea with the garlic spray and it will prevent the fungus from developing. This different spray is just bicarbonate of soda, soap and water and again it's just about spraying the leaves of the plant and it will pre prevent fungus like powdery mildew from damaging my hydrangeas. Why don't you research natural ways to control pests in your garden or in your vegetable plots? The Wildlife Trust's Action for Insects Guide can help you learn as much as possible about the sort of pests which are attracted to your plants and natural ways of controlling them. These include physical interventions like picking off slugs, putting up barriers like crushed eggshells and encouraging natural predators such as frogs and ladybirds. Pesticide Action Network UK also have a guide to gardening without pesticides. Hi again. When we're thinking about books to share with our children, it's really important to think about some books that help the children think about caring for the environment, whether it's the plants, the insects, or the animals. It's also really important and it's definitely worth considering the kind of text we could use that help children to think along those lines. There are some amazing books out there like The Lost Words and I Am The Seed That Grew The Tree which are fantastic poetry books. There are non-fiction texts and magazines that help children learn how to grow their own food, propagate plants and really develop as gardeners and then there are some fantastic narrative texts that promote environmental issues, conservation and protecting endangered species. As an English team, we've been promoting the use of classic texts with children. One of my favourite classic poems is by Philip Larkin and it's called Modesties. In this part of Modesties, Philip Larkin talks about the weeds that pop up in our garden and we're never supposed to grow. A bit like the difficulties we face in our life that we wish had never happened. His comment is that actually all these wildflowers and weeds do produce a flower but no one really takes the time to notice. A little bit like the challenges in our life can bring out some good things if we only can spot them. So hopefully sharing this poem with children will help them to notice the beauty in the world around them. Weeds are not supposed to grow but by degrees some achieve a flower although no one sees. The poem Dandelion in the book The Lost Words seeks to raise a profile of this wild flower that's so easily criticised and destroyed as a weed. Dandelion is an amazing plant. The young leaves are edible, the roots can be ground down into a coffee substitute, flowers can be turned into wine. It's an amazing source of food uh, in early spring for pollinators like bees. Each dandelion flower has got over 100 florets, 
full of nectar and pollen and they are an essential food source for a variety of wildlife. So should we just mow them and get rid of them or should we celebrate them and look after them and find a place in our garden for these wildflowers? Poem Dandelion looks to give our lovely common dandelion a new name and celebrate it as something much more than just a week. Dazzle me little son of the grass and spin me tiny time machine, no longer known as dent de lion, lion's tooth or wind blow, evening glow, milk witch or parachute. So let new names take root, thrive and grow. I would make you some such as bane of lawn perfectionists or fallen star of the football pitch or scatter seed. But never would I call you only, merely, simply weed. Let's use books and texts to help children celebrate the natural world all around. So if we're trying to care and respect for wildlife, it's really quite nice to get to know some wildlife and appreciate all the wonder and amazement of the little creatures themselves. Now, lots of mini beasts have lots of legs, some don't have any legs, uh, some of them move really really fast so my favourite mini beast to really start off with, to start investigating and having a look at in some detail and appreciating how special they are is the humble snail. So in here I have a little snail and snails are great because they like to come out and play if you know how to look after them. So you can do it on your hand um, if you don't like touching them, then um, I often get you people to start off with maybe hold a rubber glove uh, so they can't actually feel the snail through it, but they're still holding on to it. Then you can progress onto a thinner glove so you can get the sensation of the snail moving on you without actually having the slime touch you. And then maybe onto a lettuce leaf like this. Or you can just do it in your hand. If you have it crawling over your hand, you can get some really good close-up images of it. So I'm going to start off with my snail on here. So this is just a garden snail found in my garden. He's attached to this piece of wood. Take that off. Now, if you get your snail and you spray them with a little bit of water, it doesn't take long for them to start to come out to play. can borrow a camera from a phone and make yourself a little video because you can really see close up all the different textures and watch what the snail is doing really closely. See it feeling its way along with those feelers and tenai at the bottom there. But it's skin, it's, this is called the foot. Look how it moves its shell. So, so far it looks like the snail is rather partial to a little bit of cucumber and um, it kind of skipped over the grapes and the uh, rice cake and the tomatoes but it's kind of stayed with the cucumber. Uh, if we left this for a longer period of time we could then try and encourage it to try some of the strawberry and lettuce and chocolate and to just see which it prefers but it seems to be rather enjoying that cucumber. So. Then put him out of his misery for a while, so I'm gonna leave it there uh, for him to enjoy that little bit of cucumber. Uh, so when you are looking at mini bees, it's always really important to make sure they go back into their natural environment afterwards, after a short period of time. And if you're using snails, just make sure that you keep spritzing them with a little bit of water so they don't dry out, because they really don't like that. Uh, if they're unhappy, they will go back in their shell. So I'll see how long it keeps going on that cucumber. I'll show you what it looks like after a while. Um, it seems pretty happy. Uh, but it's really good once you've um, had a look at the snails, maybe you can draw the detail of them. So have a look at the antennae, look at how they move, uh, look at the shell and try and represent it as realistically as you can. Maybe use some books or the internet to find out why it's got to sets of feelers, antennae, and how they're both used differently to sense things. 
So enjoy your little experiment. Make sure you look after the creatures, put them back where they belong and just have a, um, a look at how wonderful nature really is, especially when you look up close. So we're about 20 minutes, half an hour into the experiment and you can see our snail. I feel quite sad moving him actually, but you can see how much the snail has chomped its way through the cucumber. Absolutely loves it. So I think what we'll do is we'll pop the snail back in here with the cucumber. I think you've probably had enough for now. Uh, so you can have another little chomp later on. Add a little bit more moisture and leave them for a little while and put the snail back outside. So if you want to look after some mini beasts in your garden, you can just go on a little bit of a mini beast hunt. You can take some photographs, you can video them, you can do a little plant cafe to see what they like to eat. Uh, making sure that we're being really careful and considerate to them. But here's another little trick that you can have a go at. So I've just collected some things from the outdoors, some stones, twigs, tree uh, leaves and things. And then I've got a plastic bottle and I've just cut the lid off, get an adult to help you, and cut the base off so you're left with a tube like that. And you don't want the plastic to blow away and to create litter. So we're just going to waste it down with a stone and then stuff it with twigs and leaves. And I will show you a finished one in a moment. So what I have now is this tube stuffed full with bits from the garden. And what I'm going to do is do my own little mini bee survey. I'm going to pop this outside for a week and I'm going to see what moves in. And then after a week, I'm going to bring it in, tip it out, or oh, do it outside actually, you don't need to bring it indoors. Uh, tip it out, I always like to tip it out onto a very light colored piece of material, like a pillowcase, because then you can see the mini beasts on them and see what's moved in. And then you can collect all the bits off the pillowcase again, pop them back in the mini beast home, and make sure you collect all the little bugs as well, put those back in and then put it in another location in the garden or somewhere outdoors um, around your home so don't try and put it um, somewhere where you're littering the plastic make sure you can go back and collect that later and then see what's moved in in another week's time so this is a great way to do a little mini beast uh, survey after you've done that for a few weeks make sure you discard and recycle that plastic have fun In Britain, gardens are a vital resource for our wildlife. The UK's gardens provide more space for nature than all the national nature reserves put together. But how long have British people been creating their own gardens? And how did it all start? Let's take a look at a timeline of English gardens. The earliest English gardens we know of were planted by the Roman conquerors of Britain in the 1st century AD. The best example is probably Fishbourne Roman Palace in Sussex, where an early garden has been partly reconstructed. The low box hedges are punctuated by small alcoves, which probably held ornaments like statues, urns or garden seats. Small kitchen gardens planted with fruit and vegetables were common in Roman Britain. We know very little about the English gardens in Anglo-Saxon England, which is another way of saying that the warlike Anglo-Saxons probably did not hold gardening to be very important. In the Middle Ages, gardens once more became important in British life. Monasteries had both kitchen gardens and herb gardens to provide food and medicine. Castles sometimes made room for small courtyard gardens with paths through raised flower beds. Other common features of medieval castle gardens included turf seats and high mounds or mounts which provided a view over the castle walls. The most prominent contribution of the Tudors to gardening was the knot garden. Knots were intricate patterns of lawn hedges. The spaces between the hedges were often filled with flowers, shrubs or herbs. Hampton Court Palace near London 
has reconstructions of Tudor knot gardens, but these were planted in the early 20th century. The Victorians created public gardens and green spaces full of flower beds aimed at bringing culture to the masses. Some of the finest Victorian gardens are public parks, like People's Park in Halifax. Victorian seaside resorts like Southport still display many beautiful Victorian gardens. The first Southport flower show was held in Victoria Park in 1924 and over the last 96 years millions of visitors have enjoyed the show gaining inspiration for their own garden spaces. Gardening has always been a matter of personal taste and often the outstanding works of previous generations are torn down to make way for the style of the next. For that reason, it's very hard to find unaltered examples of historical gardens in England. Throughout Britain, our gardens illustrate the British passion for creating green, growing spaces of our own. All are different and all, like their owners and creators, have a distinct personality. Music